Okay. Welcome to today's lecture. And as you can see, we are going to switch gears now. For the next two courses, we're going to talk about magnetic resonance. And then on Wednesday, La past Wednesday in two weeks, we'll have in CE4 at 4.30, course number seven on tracer kinetics. You'll find the details on Moodle on today's course. Um, so we're going to go switch now for the, with the exception of that seventh course, switch to magnetic resonance for the remainder. So it's another six lessons on magnetic resonance. And as you can guess, this is a more complicated imaging modality than what we've treated so far. So we're going to spend more time on it. Um, today, I'm going to introduce magnetic resonance. First, we're going to discuss what are the components of an MR scanner. Then what is the basis of the MR signal? Finally, how's the uh, third question is how is the nuclear magnetization affected by an external magnetic field? And lastly is how do we best describe the motion of magnetization in an external magnetic field? So well, these are the questions that we're going to address. And the first two and part of the uh, third question we'll address in the first part of today's lecture. OK, so let me start with some examples. First, with animal models. So here, this is a whole body mouse microscope. You can see here very exquisite details. And this is already giving you an idea of how this is different from the other modalities that we have exquisite soft tissue contrast. We have the intestine down here. We have the legs. This is where the brain is, the head, the jaws. This is a depiction in a, in, a, in, a, in a mouse fetus of the blood vessels. And here, this depiction of the blood vessels was done with contrast agents, very similar to what we've seen in, magnetic, uh, in, in computed tomography. They're just acting differently on the signal. This is um, a high resolution image of a brain, a coronal cut. This is the hippocampus here. This is a sagittal cut. Here's the cerebellum. The nose would be here. This is the olfactory bulb. The vessel architecture is shown here. And then here is the imaging modality that's functional imaging. So um, we'll talk about the basis of that later in, in this semester, um, how the magnetic resonance signal can not only give you exquisite anatomical contrast, but also information on function. And this is a the response of the MR signal to an external stimulation. Here's an example of a stroke study in a mouse. This is the control situation, three hours after stroke, eight hours and 24 hours, and one starts to see a lesion build up in the, in the image. That corresponds to here in this nissel stain taken at the same time. And the nissel stain is a way to measure death of neurons. And we're also going to talk about this in this semester is uh, that's linked to MR, it's spectroscopy, it's the way to read out biochemical information in vivo. OK, now when you, when you think about magnetic resonance and you think of it in terms of what you've heard so far, you think one machine, one contrast, pretty much. You've seen with PET, we have positron emitters. With SPECT, we have single photon emitters. With CT, we have essentially electron de density. We have different equipments, but basically it's always one mechanism that gives us the contrast. And with magnetic resonance, the situation is very much different. Although one buys the same machine from the vendor, one magnet, and although the physical phenomenon that underlies the whole thing is the same, there are many contrasts. What you're actually really getting with an MR scanner is many different contrast mechanism or many different modalities. And this, what I'm going to show you, is an example of the human brain without going into the details what the abbreviations mean, but just that one can appreciate the different uh, contrasts. This is a contrast called flare or fluid attenuated inversion recovery. It's designed to highlight lesions in the white matter 
particularly optimized for multiple sclerosis patients. This is a so-called T1-weighted gadolinium scan. So gadolinium is the contrast agent showing in this lesion here uptake of the contrast agent and therefore rupture of the blood-brain barrier. We have another way to, one has another way to look at cerebral blood volume, CBV. That's a depiction of, on the same patient, of the difference in cerebral blood volume, that is vascularization of the brain tissue. Here's yet another mechanism, and that is called magnetization transfer. It's a way to measure the presence of macromolecules with OH groups that exchange magnetization with the water, and it's, a, it's, it's an indirectly a way to assess the integrity, cellular integrity, and you can see here at the lesion, this is clearly lower than in the surrounding tissue. A fifth contrast is diffusion. ADC stands for apparent diffusion coefficient. There's also a way we're going to actually close the, 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 this, uh, this course talking about this mechanism here. One can also use the exquisite sensitivity of the magnetic resonance signal to motion to depict the motion of water molecules in the brain. And here it shows that there is a high mobility in this area compared to the rest of the brain. And this is consistent with cellular breakdown of this type of lesion. And finally, one can measure biochemistry. Here it's the ratio of choline. Now, this is not acetylcholine. This is uh, not even membrane-associated choline, but it's, it's, it's choline compounds uh, relative to N-acetylaspartate. It's an amino acid, very abundant in the brain, only localized in neurons. And when this ratio is high, this is a typical indicator of tumor tissue um, that can be measured. So there's also biochemical information that one can get with magnetic resonance. So maybe you can appreciate that, OK, we have one toy, one machine, but we already can show in this one single patient six quite different contrast mechanisms um, from, uh, in the brain. I'll continue with this theme, one magnet when he contrasts with the example of the rat brain. So this is an image of the rat brain showing cortical layers, contrast between cortical layers, four, five, and six, subcortical layers here. What is used here in this contrast is actually the change in magnetic field within the tissue. It's a very subtle effect, has only been recently discovered a few years back that there is information in the magnetism of the tissue in the magnetic field. Glutamate is the major neurotransmitter in the brain. This is um, a this depiction of its distribution uh, in the brain here. It's very high here on this side, and here where it's low, that's a region of stroke. One can also use contrast agents. One contrast agent that we're going to mention, and I'm showing you here, is manganese. Manganese has the interesting property that it competes with calcium for transport to the cell, so it is uh, using the same calcium channels, and this is a way to measure uh, calcium channel activity. And in this case, is a study that was done with four-paw stimulation, so you stimulate in a rat, rat the four-paw, one four-paw, and then you look at the uptake of manganese in the, somatos, uh, in, 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 in the appropriate area here, and this shows actually that the highest neuronal activity, calcium uptake, is in cortical layer 4. A last example I want to show is cerebral blood flow. Of course, our brains, those of the rodents and ours, depend on adequate transport of glucose and oxygen to the brain. Blood flow is there essential. That's why stroke is such a big problem, or hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. And this is now showing in uh, the change in blood flow. This is at rest in a rat, but it's bl blue. Again, pseudo color, it's low. When it's red, it's high. And this is showing the blood flow response when this rat is subjected to a reduction in blood glucose with an administration of insulin. And then blood flow in the brain increases. And this can be quantified with magnetic resonance in absolute terms. So. Hopefully you appreciate 
Again, one magnet, many contrasts, many modalities. We can look at the tissue function, anatomy, in many different ways, in biochemistry, uh, with essentially using the same physical phenomenon that underlies it. And we are going to talk about the first ingredient or the major ingredient of what is needed for magnetic resonance um, today. But first, I'll start with the instrumentation, what it looks like. So this is an MR scanner. It's quite similar to what you've seen for CT, PET, and SPECT, uh, for, for CT and, and PET. It's basically a nicely packaged device. What's the difference is it's a long tunnel in here. Subject gets put here on the, on the bed. This is now uh, where the head would be placed and then is inserted into the scanner. If we look at it schematically, what's inside the scanner, then this looks like this. So this is now the, the magnet here. Here's another magnet. This is now for animal studies, much smaller. This is only 12 centimeters, and here the hole is 60 centimeters. Clearly, again, as we've seen with all the previous imaging modalities, changing the species, especially mouse and rat, compared to humans, requires a change in instrumentation. Okay, so if you look, the magnet, which is here, is inside the cover here. Then we have a next element that's gradient coils. That's this element here, and we'll, we'll cover this in a few weeks, what these coils do. They're, they're also inside the cover, and then we have the so-called radio frequency coil, which is around the subject here, um, uh, this device here. We'll cover exactly what this does uh, next week. Okay, so if one cuts open a, a magnet, so now it takes the nice cover away, cuts it open, then one can see the different components here. This is the grading coil, the radio frequency coil, and the magnet will be behind here. And then you draw the whole thing as a schematic, and you get something like what you have now on the screen. And we're going to cover all that. Okay, now that, that, that's where you say, oh. No, okay, this is complex, this is complicated. I just want to show it to you to, to get you an idea. This is a complex machine. It's a very complex machine. You've got all sorts of elements. Well, for today's course, uh, for, for, for the course, we're going to cover uh, four essential elements to understand how this works. We're not going to cover the electronics. We're not going to co cover all the controlling, etc. But we're going to focus on the fundamentals. We're going to cover the nucleus because it's nuclear magnetic resonance. We're going to cover the magnet. We're going to talk about the RF coil and the gradient coil. So essentially, we need a nucleus inside the subject. We need a magnet. We need a gradient coil and a radio frequency coil. And with that, we can understand much of magnetic resonance without having to deal with all these controlling elements that are involved. OK, this is, this is now a consideration that often comes up. So I have decided to put it into the course. And this is a discussion that very often happens about the biological risks of magnetic resonance, of being around a magnetic field. So what are the risks that you have when you have a scanner, and the scanner has a magnetic field, and that magnetic field you cannot turn off? Well, why can't you turn it off? Because it is most MR magnets are made from superconducting wire. They're cooled down to 4 kelvins or the, in a helium bath. And they're superconducting, so the electrons are running around in there. The current is in there. And if you keep feel, keeping it cold, the current will be in there for 1,000 years. So consequence is the magnet is never turned off. Now, what kind of magnetic fields are we talking here? So we'll, we'll call this B0, and we'll stick with this notation for the rest of the course. The unit is, is Tesla. The Earth's magnetic field is, is something like 50 microtesla. That's what we have around here right now. You can measure it with these devices. They have a little magnet meter inside, a little compass. Electromagnets. So you turn on the current, you produce with a normal wire, you produce a magnetic field. There you can produce a field that is less than 1.5 Tesla. 
And for MRI, you typically, what's used is one between one and seven Tesla. Just to give you an idea, we had 50 micro Tesla here, and we're going into the Tesla range for MRI. So this is a powerful magnet. So you can do powerful things. And I want to illustrate this with a few videos, because if you are, and some of you might actually have volunteered for MR scans at the CIBM, um, so you get these questionnaires like, that look pretty intimidating, but this is the major risk that one has with an MR scan. But the first, what you're going to see is a big aluminum block put at the outside of the magnet, still in the magnetic field, and when you let it fall, outside it falls. When you put it inside the magnetic field, you let it fall, it falls very slowly. So these are eddy currents, so when the, mag when the block falls, because it's conducting, it changes the magnetic flux, and according to Lenk's rule, it builds up an opposing magnetic field, which slows down its fall. Okay, the next video that you're gonna see is a tennis ball filled with nails. Nails have the nice property that they're ferromagnetic, so they're attracted by a magnetic field. Okay, so let's see what happens. It's going inside the scanner and then sticks to the side. Okay, so what is the major danger being around an MRI scanner? Well, it's not a major danger, but it's one that is easily overseen. I come into the MR scanner, I've got my pen here, and I go to see how the patient is doing. There's a little thing here that's where you clip it, that's magnetic. When I bend over, it goes whoop in there, becomes a projectile, and if it flies the wrong path, can do quite some damage. Okay, um, let's illustrate this. This is a video from a friend of mine. I actually discovered it by accident by searching YouTube. He has a personal YouTube channel, uh, but he's a director of an uh, MRI facility at NIH. I want you to focus on these two guys that are working here. It's not capturing every frame, but every now and then. So they're putting up some kind of shelf inside this magnet, which is on field. Notice what he's carrying here in his hand. That's a drill here. You see, that's a handheld drill with a battery inside it and an electromotor. So they're looking at this, putting this together. Oops, something happened. Where's the drill? The drill is now inside. Okay, and now they're frantically looking what, uh, how to get the drill out. So what happened is he wasn't paying attention. He was looking around, carrying the drill in his hand. When he got too close, whoop, it was inside. It became a projectile. Luckily, there was nobody in there. Okay, a bit more dramatic dem demonstration is this one. This is a gas bottle. Okay, gas bottles are used in hospitals to keep patients alive with oxygen or with air. This is a standard oxygen tank. They're going to put it here on the patient bed. And what you see here, this, this watermelon is mimicking the position of a human head inside this RF-12. OK, let's look at this in slow motion. It's being attracted. The force increases. The accel it's accelerated. And bang, it hits the, the head that is the watermelon. Here, you can see it's completely disintegrated. So let's go look at the end of the manga, what happened to that watermelon. They're going to take us back with the camera. OK, here's the coil smashed to the ground, destroyed the watermelon in all sorts of funny places splashed around. So it's a pretty strong impact of the watermelon, uh, of, the, of the oxygen bottle. Now, they did this for demonstration purposes. 
Uh, but as you will see, this actually happened in 2001 to a patient. What happened there was, this was in New York, what happened was there was a patient, a six-year-old patient, coming for a follow-up scan after cancer treatment to see where the cancer was. And the way they had set up the MRI, there was the MRI room and the hallway right next to it. And somebody was talking about an oxygen bottle and a nurse trained in their instinct to help a patient in need grabbed the oxygen bottle, thinking that was a problem with the patient, walked into the room, she took a standard oxygen bottle, and the oxygen bottle was attracted by the magnet and killed that patient. Okay, I have myself helped with eight other guys pull an oxygen bottle out of a magnet with a similar incident, and they typically always happen uh, because there is a medical urgency and medical staff is trained to focus on the patient and not on the danger of the equipment. You can't smell the magnetic field, you can't feel it in general. So, and here's an illustration. In this case, a chair was attracted. You can see they got the pulley here, and the guys are now with this wooden lever trying to pull the chair back. Now this is primarily a plastic chair, so there's just some springs in there. And yay, here's they, they succeeded to pull the chair back. Okay, so this is nothing, this is a look, this, this is a bit like dangerous if you walk down these stairs here and take every fourth step. If you don't pay attention, you'll fall and break your neck. Here, if you don't pay attention and we don't screen you for magnetic objects, be it a pen, be it a paper clip around the magnet, then there is a risk of an incident. And that's why you have all these intimidating warnings around an MRI magnet. Okay, now this is something that I think is still discussed in Europe, and that's the question, what is the danger of being exposed to a magnetic field? And um, you might remember the discussions about power lines, that there was some concerns about power lines, and there's been some attempts, or they have actually regulated this, on um, how much you can be exposed to a magnetic field. And we'll see later today also why uh, other considerations. But what I'm going to give you the argument here is, and this is a qualitative argument why I personally don't think that MRI is that all that dangerous to be around the magnetic field in terms of magnetic field change. So there's transcranial magnetic stimulation which has rather subtle behavioral effects. It's a tool that's used for neuroscience research. And it basically, the way it's, it's, it's used is you produce a magnetic field that goes from zero to two Tesla in 100 microseconds, which corresponds to a change of 20,000 Tesla in one second. That's a relative conservative estimate to give you an idea what this device is. Here's the coil, here's the patient, and here in the occipital lobe where the visual system is, this will exp experience a strong magnetic field change from this coil, but that is used on normal volunteers and often uh, very every second. So what would this kind of field change mean if I were to walk around a 7 Tesla magnet? How fast would I have to approach a 7 Tesla magnet to produce the same kind of magnetic field change and likely to produce the same kind of stimulation in the nervous system? So let's suppose one walks to 7 Tesla with the same change in magnetic field, dBdt, 20,000 Tesla per second, and let's assume that we're doing this walk over 1.4 meters. That's very conservative. So then we have a change of magnetic field of 5 Tesla per meter, over 1.4 meters, 7 Tesla, going from 0 to 7. So that's a 5 Tesla per meter change. If we now take the velocity times this change, then this should give us the rate of change of magnetic field that we're experiencing, so in that we want it to be 20,000 Tesla per second. And then we have the delta B d dx over delta x, so we can calculate the velocity that is necessary. Okay, with this calculation, this would mean we would have to run towards the magnet at 4,000 meters per second, or 14 thousand kilometers per hour, per, per hour. Okay, this is about 10 times the Earth's rotational speed. We're running right now, we're circling the Earth at about 400 
meters per second. Okay, now there's another consideration that is the area over which the magnetic field change is applied. So if we take that into consideration with Faraday's law, the induced voltage, which is essentially what stimulates the brain here, is proportional to the area and the change in magnetic field. So let's correct for the surface area. Such a TMS coil with a radius of 5 centimeters would have an area of 0 0.008 square meters. And let's say the upper trunk of a human is about half a square meter. It's about 20 centimeters by a meter or something like that, or a bit bigger. Um, that's a fair estimate. It's not important what the exact numbers is, are, but to get some ideas here. And if we correct for that, then the velocity that we should have to produce the same change in voltage induced in the body would have to be 63 meters per second, or 220 kilometers per hour. Still a decent run. Not even Usain Bolt can do that. Okay, now next consideration. Most of the magnetic field is inside the magnet. So when, once you get outside of the magnet, it already has fallen off considerably. So you, if you walk around the magnet, you're not exposed to 7 Tesla. You're exposed to more like 4 or 5 Tesla or 3 Tesla. And usually when you enter a room of a magnetic resonance scanner, you don't start at 0 Tesla. There is already a magnetic field. And so you don't end at 7 Tesla. The distance typically is more like 7 meters and not 1.4 meters. So this effect, the velocity that we would have to have, would have to be even larger. So it can be several fold higher. And I guess that's a bit my argument here, why these considerations of how fast one can walk around the magnet that the European Union has imposed um, have parted with good intention, but I don't think that they are really applicable in this case. And this is a safe technique. OK, so now let's get to from the magnet to the magnetism. So we'll now talk about nuclear magnetism. And I'll give here a very qualitative argumentation on the rationale why certain nuclei have a magnetic moment, produce magnetism, why certain don't. So we can associate a nucleus typically with an angular momentum. Angular momentum we know from the physics course is L, but we'll call it here P. So here's the nucleus, and it has a certain angular momentum associated with it. Now, if it has another angular momentum associated with it, and that's, this is very qualitative. It's not proper in the strict sense, but it gives us an intuitive feel. If it has an angular momentum, an object has an angular momentum will rotate. If it rotates, if you think of the nucleus as a sphere that's positively charged that rotates, then at the surface you have moving charge, and if you have moving charge, you have a current. So you have a ring current. If you have a ring current, like this, then you produce a magnetic dipole moment. That would be in blue here, and we call it mu. So rotating current gives us a dipole moment. So an, a, a nucleus uh, with an angular momentum can have a dipole moment. OK, and then the simplification that's very often done and I'll do it here as well, is one can think of each nucleus as a little bar magnet. In terms of its magnetic properties, it's not a bar magnet. It won't move physically based on the external magnetic field, but its magnetic properties are corresponding to the dipole of a little bar magnet. OK, so if we now look at the magnetic moment of an individual spin in a induction field B0 in an external field, then the magnetic moment is actually linked to the angular momentum. It's proportional, and the proportionality constant is called gamma, or gyromagnetic ratio. That's now a quantity that's good to remember because this we will see uh, very often in the course from now on. Okay, so that's the classical intuitive picture, the rationale why Certain nuclei have a magnetic moment. And now comes the weird part from quantum physics, and that is that this angular momentum cannot just be pointing, or this, this uh, uh, dipole moment does not just point in any uh, direction in space, but it is quantized. 
So that basically means that in the external magnetic field, the Z component of the angular momentum has two L plus one values, or two I plus one values, and we call those MI. This is the angular momentum given here with Planck's constant. So in other words, um, here for a so-called spin three half nucleus, we have four different orientations along Z that are possible. Nothing else, that's what quantum physics tells us. One can still calculate and measure a total angular momentum of the nucleus or magnetic moment, but the Z component is always um, has these four discrete values in this particular case. Of particular interest for our course is spin one half, so that means the angular momentum um, I is one half, so you have two times one half plus one, you have two possibilities. Total angular momentum is given here by this expression, and what it means for spin one half is that you have two different possibilities of the Z component of the angular momentum or dipole moment. So what kind of nuclei are NMR active, that is have a non-zero magnetic moment? Well, we have some that have a zero magnetic moment. Carbon-12 is one. Ah, that is important in life sciences. Carbon is important. Well, 99% of the carbons, they have even mass, even atomic number. They have no spin. They have no angular momentum. So they're at spin zero. They're uninteresting for us. Oxygen is, a, is the same story, oxygen 16. Then we have spin one half, and those are the ones we're going to talk about in this course. That's protons, carbon, and nitrogen 15, carbon 13. Here, they have a spherical charge distribution in the nucleus. And then we have the uh, nuclei with a angular momentum number bigger than one half. They have an ellipsoidal charge distribution in the nucleus. They are um, what we call the quadrupolar nuclei. So they have actually inside an electrical field in the magnet and uh, in the in the nucleus, and there are some uh, rules. If you have odd mass and odd atomic number, then they are a multiple of one half. If they have even mass and odd atomic number, then I is an, an integer. Okay, so this is just for completeness here. We're not going to really talk about these nuclei here. Um, a big example that is often used is sodium-23, and another one is deuterium. Okay, now let's look at the gyromagnetic ratio for these different nuclei. This is the net spin, so I is one half for protons. The gyromagnetic ratio is 42 megahertz per tesla. We'll talk about what this means. And the natural abundance, that is the percentage of hydrogen atoms that are H1, the proper isotope, is basically 100%. Deuterium is very low. It's also gyromagnetic ratio is lower. Then you've got another spin one half, that's phosphorus 31, is a bit higher, and the abundance here is 100%, so all phosphorus atoms carry phosphorus 31. Here's sodium and nitrogen 15. We have carbon 13 and fluorine 19. The, the ones that are in yellow are the ones that are in, uh, in MR that are measured. And this gives you an idea. Fluorine is very close to hydrogen. This has an importance, as we will see later, on the sensitivity of the scan, uh, of the effect. For all intents and purposes for the course, we're going to pretty much stick with hydrogen. We're going to forget about the other nuclei. This is just for completeness there, that we know that the gamma is not the same. You'll see in, this, in the problem sets that we sometimes give you problems with different gyromagnetic ratio, just that we remind ourselves that it's not just has to be protons. But for all intents and purposes, 99% of MRI is done on protons, on H1, and this is the relevant nucleus to measure. So what is the basis of nuclear magnetism? I have just told you that the nucleus has a magnetic moment that is quantized. I haven't told you how this produces a magnetism. So let's consider the energy of a magnetic dipole in an external field on the classical way. So the energy is given by 
the scalar product of the magnetic moment with um, with the magnetic field. And if you look at this energy, we can ask ourselves when is this energy minimal? And it's minimal when the magnetic moment is parallel to the external magnetic field. So where is that used? Which famous guy that we all know whose name has used that? That a magnetic dipole aligns itself with the external magnetic field. I'm going to demonstrate this shortly, how this, how this works with the um, field. Well, what happens is actually we've got an equation of motion here. There's a torque that's applied on the magnetic moment if the magnetic moment is not parallel to B0. And the guy who used this was Christopher Columbus. Okay, so he had some magnetic needle that would orient itself parallel to the Earth's magnetic field and would tell him where north is and where south is. So that's where that is used. Okay, so we'll illustrate this. This torque is real. And you can see it also on the screen. This should be screen camera one. Okay, so if you look here, this is the, my dipole. It's a normal bar magnet. This is my external magnetic field. So it's coils with a yoke will produce a nice magnetic field. Um, and if I turn this on, you can see now it's attracted. The south is attracted this way. The north is attracted this way. And it tries to align itself. Obviously, the spring here prevents it from complete alignment. And now I'll turn this switch here. We'll go the other way around. Now the magnetic field is inversed. I've inversed the magnetic field, and now the magnet is pulled the other way. That would be this way. So this is the same kind of principle, and this kind of equation is um, also be, being used in MRI. OK, so quantum mechanically, the quantum mechanical description here is we have, for each quantum number, we have an energy level that's given by the gyromagnetic ratio, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, times the quantum number, times the magnetic field. That's the quantum mechanical description of this equation here. And mi goes from minus i to plus i. So if I take now a spin 1 half, I have an energy level of E2 here which is given by minus gamma h over 4 pi. Because we are having spin 1 half, it's divided by 4. So we have n2 spins in that energy level, n2 nuclei. And then we have the other, other energy level, which is higher. So we have higher energy. And here we have the m i equals minus 1 half. And we have n1 nuclei in that energy level. This gives us an energy level difference of delta E, which is given just by the energy difference of these two, gamma h over 2 pi times b0. OK, now there's another thing that comes from quantum mechanics. That's the Boltzmann distribution. And what the Boltzmann distribution says, how, how are the numbers n1 and n2, the number of spins that are in upper energy level, related to the number of spins that are in the lower energy level? So we'll just give you this, and this ratio is actually given by the difference in the energy level divided by kT, e to the minus the whole thing, this expression here. What is the result of this is that n, since delta E is non-zero, kT is non-zero, n1 is not equals to n2, we have a slight difference in population between level 1 and level 2. And that is the basis of nuclear magnetization. OK, here's k, Boltzmann's constant. Now, how big is this difference? At 310 Kelvin, we have about one in out of a million protons that is in the lower energy state at one Tesla. You can do the math yourself with, with, by putting this in. There's some exercises here. But basically, it means one out of a million. OK, it's like the Americans when they voted for the president in 14 years ago in 2000. There was a similar difference in the votes. So it's a very small difference. 
So basically, n1 is equals to n2, almost equals, and equals to ha half of n, and n here is the number of spins that are in our voxel. OK, so we have n1, n2 spins in the lower energy level. That's how we start out. I actually should go back here. This is actually achievable. And where is this achievable? That all the spins are sitting in the lower energy level. It's the ground state, and that's at 0 Kelvin. Then everything is down here. If we start to increase the temperature, then more and more of the nuclei will go into the higher energy level. And 2, etc. It's just an animation here. So more and more, as the temperature increases, this difference in number of spins in upper energy level to the lower energy level will decrease gradually. OK, so this gives us a difference in, in, in uh, number of spins, number of uh, magnetic moments, a certain number of points down, a certain number of points up. The transitions by which an, a spin changes the energy level is given by the energy provided by photons, h nu here, similar to what we've seen as equal to delta E. So that's a bit to make the link with the X-ray imaging where we've talk, talked about H nu as well. So where are we in the electromagnetic spectrum? NMR is here on this side of the spectrum in between in the microwave range. It's around 10 to the 8 uh, hertz in frequency. We have gamma ray X-ray over here. This is the visible light. We're far in the non-visible light. This also means that we're not dealing with um, with ionizing radiation for magnetic resonance. OK, so before we break, I told you it's an introduction to magnetic resonance this course. Yet yeah, you, you all agree we're talking about the property of the nucleus, right? All right. The chemists know this as NMR, nuclear magnetic res resonance. Why on earth in the biomedical imaging field is this called MRI or magnetic resonance? The word nuclear scared people, OK. Um, correct. Now, when did the name change? It actually was used to be called an MRI. Hmm? During the Cold War, that's correct. The Cold War was a few de de decades. Um, this, I like to tell this story. So in, in 1986, the American College of Radiology, the guys who have the most of the business with these devices, decided to change the name from NMRI to MRI. Um, what happened also in 1986? Chernobyl. Exactly. So what happened in practice is because, as you can see, this is a very physical phenomenon. It's not easy to explain to, to people, well, it's got nuclear in it, but it's got nothing to do with nuclear energy, nuclear bombs, and all this stuff. It's just an electromagnetic property of a nucleus. You'd have to have some background in physics to be able to explain that for the average physician that is treating the patient, sticking them in a the magnet. This is pushing their understanding and skills of explanation to the limit. So the decision was made to drop the N from an MRI, and so now it's called MRI. But the mechanism that I've just explained to you, the background, whether it's the chemists across the street on this side towards the east, or whether it's to the south in the CIBM, where we, use the we essentially use the same physical phenomenon that's behind this. OK, with that, um, we'll break and we'll continue with the second part of the course after the break.